To the victor goes the spoils. Throughout human history, the victorious army will tend to take from the vanquished. But following World War II, a controversial and morally questionable operation took place. The Allied forces sought to take into their employ a number of Nazi scientists and engineers. A great many of these individuals were well aware of the Holocaust, massively benefited from the horrendous circumstances, or largely engaged in crimes against humanity. And yet, 1600 were able to start a new life in the United States, free from prosecution and landing high-ranking positions in the likes of NASA. In today's video, we will cover the motivations for the operation and the individuals who were able to start a new life in the United States, in what was termed Operation Paperclip. It is perhaps helpful to start with the situation following the Normandy landings. From the west and the east, the Nazi state faced defeat. But amongst the advancing armies were individuals whose jobs were to identify, catalogue and obtain Nazi technology. It was a widely held belief at the time that the key reasons for the early Nazi victories in Europe was due to the superior German technology. In 1943, the Alsos mission was launched by the British and American intelligence agencies to in particular discover Germany's capacity in the ABCs. The ABCs meaning the atomic, biological and chemical weapons. The key goal was not to only obtain the information for their respective states, but to also ensure that such material did not fall into Soviet hands. Even before the end of the war, many had come to realise that the Soviet Union would be the next big threat to the West. It was therefore seen as vital that the American forces develop a technological advance over the Soviets to maintain their own influence and supremacy. This was to be achieved through utilising German and Nazi research. As the Soviets pressed into Berlin, the Nazi government put together a list of their scientists, engineers and technicians. The goal was to pull such people from the front lines or wherever they may be, and enlist them in the defence of the Reich. Werner Osenberg, the man in charge of the Nazi defence research, was placed in charge of vetting the suitability of thousands of such people as to their political reliability. But in March of 1945, a Polish lab assistant at the Bonn University came across fragments of Osenberg's list and soon passed on the details to the British and American intelligence. This list would form the basis for the key list of targets that Operation Paperclip would look to recruit. But there was a moral quandary. As more and more details of the Holocaust emerged, it became ever clearer of the knowledge many in Germany held about the genocides and crimes against humanity that had been committed. A programme of denazification was to be enacted. Evidence of the gas chambers, the mass graves and the appalling conditions of the survivors was shown to all. Posters and flies were set up as Germans were sent questionnaires to ascertain their culpability. The aim was to put as many Germans as possible before the Allied judges to rule on a person's responsibility for the crimes committed. This was to ensure that the Nazi state was not only defeated militarily, but that also Nazism as an ideology was destroyed. Many, if not all of the desired scientists had been members of the Nazi party. Some of the research, notably in the fields of human biology, was obtained through the use of human experimentation on unwilling captives. And so, a distinction started to form. There were what were termed ardent Nazis, who were eagerly and willing engaged in the Holocaust and who believed that Nazism was justified. Such people could not be tolerated and were required to be put before the international courts. Then, there were those who, whilst being card-carrying Nazi members, only joined to continue their career and not be ostracised from society. They were not willing participants. These more moderate Nazis were to be tolerated by the Allied government if it meant their research and technical know-how could be of benefit. Such distinctions, however, would soon become meaningless. A very key example of this can be seen in the priority given to the recruitment of Werner von Braun, placing him at the top of the list. Braun had joined the Nazis in 1973 and had subsequently joined the SS in 1940 following an invitation to do so from its head, Heinrich Himmler. By this time, Braun had established himself as the premier scientist in the field of rocketry. 
Braun had been recognized by Walter Dornberger in the early 1930s, and the pair pushed for research into the military application of Braun's rockets. The culmination of Braun's work was the Fair Geltenswaffen II, or Vengeance Weapons. Such weapons were designed to enact vengeance against the Allied forces and to break the morale of civilian populations. The rockets were first launched against London on the 6th of September 1944. The V-2 rocket travelled over 200 miles in just minutes. Travelling at supersonic speeds, the rocket proved impossible to stop and resulted in the deaths of around 9,000 people. However, the death toll for those who made the rockets was even higher. The underground Mittelwerk factory in which the rockets were built was dug out by enslaved labourers from the Mittelbaudora concentration camp. Euphemistically called guest workers, thousands died due to the harsh conditions or were murdered for lack of productivity. The corpses of those who failed to meet targets were hanged at the entrance of the factory as a warning to others. Approximately one third of all prisoners sent to Mittelbaudora would die there. At the end of the war, Braun, Donberger and hundreds of their staff made their way to American lines, escaping the more fanatical SS members who wished to continue the fight. Braun and his team were interrogated at the former headquarters of the Luftwaffe, Castle Kranzberg, which was codenamed Dustbin. By late 1945, Braun was in the United States, stationed at Fort Bliss in Texas with a number of his peers who continued their work on aerospace rocketry. By the 1950s, Braun developed the Redstone rocket, which was used for the first live nuclear ballistic missiles test conducted by the US. The rocket was noted for its high precision guidance systems, but it was Braun's work with NASA that is perhaps the most famous. He had long sought to popularise the notion of human space travel, working alongside Walt Disney on a number of productions in the 1950s. NASA was formed in response to the successful launch of the Sputnik satellite by the Soviet Union. Following this, Braun was brought in to complete and develop an orbital launch vehicle. By 1961, the Mercury Redstone rocket launched the first American into space, but again behind the Soviets. But the success of the Saturn V rocket was perhaps Braun's crowning achievement, creating the vehicle that would take the first humans out of low Earth orbit and onto the moon. Such an achievement would in all likelihood never have been possible without the work of Operation Paperclip and in recruiting Braun and his cadre of scientists. Whilst von Braun and his rockets display the flashier, more public side of Operation Paperclip, many more scientists and engineers made their way to the United States in a number of other roles. Huberta Stronghold was a German researcher with close ties to the highest echelons of Nazi leadership, notably Hermann Göring. Whilst he was never a Nazi party member, his contributions were centred around the aeromedical research, the effects of light on the human body. During the war, prisoners from Dachau concentration camp were used as human test subjects. These included tests on inmates being immersed in freezing water and forced into pressure chambers. Many would be killed as a result. Whilst Strunghold may or may not have had a direct hand in the crimes against humanity, he no doubt benefited from the research. He was listed by the Allies as a person responsible for the crimes committed in Dachau. Strunghold's Institute for Aviation Medicine is understood to have experimented on six epileptic children. These children were placed in vacuum chambers, which resulted in the children experiencing epileptic seizures. The goal was to simulate the impact of high-altitude sickness, such as hypoxia. In 1974, Strunghold continued his research on behalf of the United States into what he termed as space medicine or astrobiology, the effects on the human body during space travel. He was brought over as part of Operation Paperclip. Another controversial figure was Kurt Blum. Officially, he was researching cancer treatments, though this was likely a cover for the biological warfare research he was engaged in. His title in the Reich was Deputy Minister for Health. The Nazi research sought to utilize the bubonic plague, typhoid, cholera and anthrax as weapons against the Allies. In 1943, Blum proposed the use of infected mosquitoes to spread malaria to enemy forces. Blum also sought to make use of the deadly nerve agents, tabun and sarin, the goal of dispersing the agents via spraying from planes. 
From 1943, Blum used concentration camp prisoners in his experiments. And for those of you who know about Unit 731, Blum benefited from an exchange of biological and chemical warfare research between Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Such research from Japan coming from the notorious Unit 731 and the inhumane treatment of its prisoners. For those who want to learn more, we do have a video on the subject, which shares similarities with the Operation Paperclip 2. Despite all of this being well known, Blum escaped conviction in the 1947 doctor's trials in Nuremberg, in large part due to his knowledge being in demand, and as he was able to give information on others who had conducted human experiments. In 1951, Blum was recruited by the US Army Chemical Weapons Corps in a successor program to Operation Paperclip. Akin to the methods of Operation Paperclip, Blum's conviction and trial were omitted from his paperwork. It is important to note a few other examples, such as Georg Rickey, who was the director of the Mittelwerk V2 factory. A member of the Nazi party before Hitler's rise to Chancellor, Rickey became noted as a leading engineer of the underground bunkers. He oversaw the use of slave labors in Mittelwerk factory, driving the workers to death and putting in place the worst conditions. Whilst he was initially co-opted by Operation Paperclip and sent to America, evidence soon came to light about his role in the treatment of concentration camp prisoners. As a result, he was sent back to Germany to face the Nuremberg courts. Although he was ultimately acquitted, he was not to return to the United States under their employment. Whilst there was a concerted effort to denazify Germany and hold those accountable for the crimes against humanity, there was however a far laxer approach when it came to those with knowledge that might benefit the Allied military. There was the fear that Nazism could be spread by those who still clung to the ideology, and so stringent checks ought to be put in place. But in the face of such a threat posed by the Soviet Union, the West shared a common goal with those who rose through the ranks of Nazi Germany, the defeat of communism. The Soviet Union in their march to Berlin were also able to obtain a number of Nazi scientists to bolster their own programs. One notable example is Manfred von Ardeen, who was instrumental in the Soviets' own nuclear bomb development. Operation Paperclip resulted in at least 1,600 Nazi scientists receiving what can only be described as the perfect situation. The opportunity to continue their work, to avoid prosecution, to be safe with their families, and a chance to destroy communism. Whilst the plans to denazify Germany were noble, the fact that exceptions were made does strike an ill chord. The engineers, scientists and technicians did provide a huge benefit to the United States, but in many instances their research under Nazi Germany was directly tied to or benefited from the crimes against humanity that defined the Nazi regime. One of the key results of the Second World War was the implementation of the Declaration of Human Rights and the mechanisms to punish those who breached those rights. And yet, crimes were overlooked scientists recruited, and justice was not served. Perhaps it is best to end with a quote from von Braun reflecting on his role in the Nazi war effort, which displays his misplaced nationalism and his blinkered approach to his work. I have very deep and sincere regret for the victims of the V2 rockets, but there were victims on both sides. A war is a war, and when my country is at war, my duty is to help win that war.